This is another perspective which is going to uh, uh, complement some of the things uh, that we have been discussing. And uh, so I have written over here uh, my part-time affiliation. So I'm part-time, I'm working part-time at LinkedIn, especially this is my sabbatical year. Um, and a lot of the things that I'll discuss today uh, uh, has been uh, inspired by discussions with people in industry because uh, there are various other concerns uh, or uh, considerations that come up while designing an algorithm which just goes beyond uh, optimal complexity bounds or optimal statistical uh, error bounds uh, or optimal iteration complexity. It depends upon the hardware we are training things on, uh, the amount of resources we have, whether we are training on CPUs, GPUs, etc. Right? But uh, though they, many, of the idea, many of the ideas have been inspired by that, the majority of the talk is going to be on uh, more mathematical stuff, things that we kind of uh, understand, drawing from techniques from mathematical optimization as well as mathematical statistics. All right, so the outline of the talk is on constraint optimization as arising in statistics and machine learning problems. Okay, so what I'll do, so this is the theme of the talk. What I'll do is I'll talk about what I mean by this, because of course, uh, what I mean by constraint optimization, uh, this is being shaped uh, over time. This has some similarities with the things that have been discussed in this uh, uh, workshop, uh, but there are other uh, avenues as well. So I'll discuss mainly the role of sparsity. That is, how do you have a compressed model? And why this? Because this is a problem that uh, there has been a lot of study on this across various communities, statistics, applied math, computer science, OR, and so on and so forth. So we like to take the setup of basic linear models and then try and understand it at a very, very deep level. So I'll start with linear models and then some of our statistical understanding of this, some of our computational understanding of this. A lot of this has been triggered by recent uh, uh, explorations of discrete optimization, especially integer programming problems. Uh, but we see that uh, many of the computational problems, as well as statistical issues, go beyond just directly applying off-the-shelf integer programming solvers to these problems. I'll talk about extensions, uh, non-parametric models. This terminology is used a lot in statistics. The model that I will use is also used a lot in statistics. But this deals with a very important problem. How do I do feature selection when the conditional expectation function is not linear in X? Okay. Some of these ideas, though they were developed uh, in the context of more classical uh, statistics or machine learning problems, I would say classical ML problems, uh, some of these with some modification can be adapted to, uh, uh, to, to consider some more modern problems, that is compression of neural networks. So I'll get to this, I'll give you a very brief overview of this later on, but what this basically means is uh, of course, uh, various organizations, various researchers are working very hard to build uh, neural network models with very, very high accuracy. But in many cases, based on what I understand, is these, network, these ne neural network models can be difficult to deploy because they have often billions or hundreds of millions of parameters. They have amazing accuracy, but they can be hard to deploy because of latency issues, infra issues, and so on and so forth. There are inference times, there are in, uh, inference times as in uh, how fast you can do evaluations, uh, predictions, uh, whether you can uh, serve them online and things like that. So that leads to the issue of you have a large network, then can you sparsify it? There are various ways to compress a network. Since over here I'll talk about sparsity, there, uh, I'll talk about how sparsity can be used over here. But I would like to outline over here that this is not purely an optimization problem. Because if you optimize very hard, what we have found out is the out-of-sample performance hurts. This is something that we do not understand very well, uh, but there is basically a trade-off that happens. Uh, it depends upon the algorithm choice, it depends upon the amount of compression that you're doing, and how much of accuracy you're losing. In some cases, you actually can gain accuracy, but then it needs access to more computational resources. There's actually a, a, a more fascinating example arising in neural networks. This is known as a sparse mixture, mixture of experts. So traditionally in feature selection in linear models, we have predefined features. And for all the sample, I mean, uh, we either select a feature or not. This one is interesting because the 
the sparsity pattern also depends upon the input sample. So the part of the network that is going to be activated, that depends upon the, uh, upon, upon the input sample. So this, is, this has actually also leads rise to various interesting sparsity or structured problems. I'll not get uh, time to talk about this in today's uh, talk, but I'm happy to talk about this uh, offline. So here is another problem, and this I took this example because it relates to some of the things that have been dis that that were being discussed in this uh, uh, workshop. How do I train trees? So training trees, decision trees, these are amazing objects. Okay, and uh, we started looking at this because we had some industry collaborators. They were saying that we use multitask. Uh, great, uh, we use uh, 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 multitask. Uh, uh, decision trees for a single tree. Sorry, they use single task uh, methods, uh, but we want to have a, have a version of XGBoost or boosting or an ensemble of trees which can take into account multiple tasks. It's a very innocuous problem, but it turns out that there is very limited existing software, like XGBoost has very limited functionality to extend to the multi-class setting. In other words, if I come and tell you I want to change the loss function to say, for example, a zero inflated uh, uh, regression problem, Poisson loss, which often arises in uh, insurance problems, I cannot go to scikit-learn and change the loss function easily. So interesting questions arise, and then we see that there is an interesting mix over here between should I use continuous optimization for this problem or should I use discrete optimization? Now, the reason I'm saying this over here is inherently, Trees are trained with discrete optimization, right? You find out a tree, a, a split greedily, and then you go down. It's done in a greedy fashion. Is that the right way to do it? Or should I think of a way to do it in, with end-to-end -end continuous optimization? Okay? It also depends. Should you add it as a layer in a tree, in a, in a neural network, or not? So there are various interesting questions over here. I will give you a, a very broad outline of my understanding of this. This area, uh, I don't have a good understanding as to what should I use, but I think it depends upon the application. All right, of course, uh, acknowledgments. Uh, all the work over here would not have been, uh, the work over here would not have been possible without the amazing work done by my students, both present and former. Uh, the work that I'll be presenting touches upon the work that they have done. Uh, so Kehan, Antoine, uh, both present and former students, Hussein, Shibal, Brian, Ali, uh, and how you, they're all from MIT. All of them are my students. Some of them are masters, some of them are PhD students. Uh, um, I'd also like to thank Peter Ajdenko, he's from the University of Sydney, a longtime collaborator. Uh, Emmanuel Ben David uh, uh, from the US Census Bureau. So some of the aspects of uh, non-parametric models and feature selection is done in uh, collaboration with him and uh, many people from, from Google research. <clears throat> All right, so algorithmic aspects of several problems in statistical learning uh, can be interpreted as optimization problems with constraints and or uh, uh, discrete decision variables. So I think for this audience, this, this is something that doesn't need a big introduction, but I'll just illustrate with examples. This is biased towards some of the work that I've done. So let's think about a very, very classic example. I'm not saying you should do this, but if I look at classification, zero, one loss, whether I make an error or not, that can be posed as a discrete problem. Let's think about regression, right? So I'm minimizing some kind of a loss function, CLE squares loss function, subject to various constraints. These constraints can arise in different settings. A budget on the number of non-zero regression coefficients, this is feature selection. In some cases, often, there is a cost associated with acquiring features. Some features can cost more compared to some other features. So then how will you incorporate uh, the cost of, uh, of selecting a feature in your, in your uh, estimation procedure? These are all examples of statistical learning with constraints. I'll touch upon this, and this is an important interpretability constraint, again, taken from the pages of, of statistics, uh, uh, classical statistics uh, methods. <clears throat> Suppose we build a linear model with main fx, and we want to uh, uh, make it more flexible. So we include pairwise interaction fx. The number of interaction fx can be large. You often want to reduce the number of interaction fx as well as main fx. So there is a notion of strong hierarchy, which basically says the interaction effect between a variable i and j should be included only if its parents are selected. OK? 
Okay, so I'm not saying this should always be used, but there are people who think that this is an important constraint to have. So it's a very discreet problem. <clears throat> so training a decision tree on an ensemble of trees, this is something that I mentioned before. <clears throat> and this is, this is actually uh, uh, something that I got very fascinated with, that is, how do you post-process a model that has been created, for example, by your organization? After several months of tuning, it has been created by you. What you want to do is you don't want to retrain that with fairness constraints. Because honestly, fairness, fairness constraints, there are various definitions of it. You don't know which one you would be using. And the other thing is, if I want to train my neural network model with additional fairness constraints, if there are hundreds of millions of samples, it's not really clear how to do it. Probably the algorithm has to be changed from scratch directly. What this does is it says, all right, so your team has built up a, 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 a prediction method. I would basically look at a very small perturbation of that prediction model such that it satisfies a bunch of fairness constraints. In some cases, these fairness constraints can be written as linear programming constraints, LP representable. In some cases, they actually lead to natural integer programming problems. Okay, so this is, a, uh, this is something that we did with uh, my collaborators at LinkedIn. All right, so, so we also know that continuous and especially convex optimization has played a significant role in machine learning and statistics. They work very well. Uh, but what, what I like to think about is how can we adapt these methods or should we think about new methods or close relatives so that we can handle problems with, uh, with constraints? Or potentially, since here I'm talking about discrete variables, how do I deal with discrete variables? Now again, it depends. Am I using PyTorch or TensorFlow to do the training? Or am I doing the code in Julia or Python? It depends, okay? The proposal over here is, let's, let's think about uh, expanding uh, beyond popular algorithms. Uh, let's look at algorithms that are out there in the math programming community. There are a very rich class of algorithms out there. Some of them are go probably going to be suited for task A. Some of them are going to be suited for task B, okay? Or C and so on and so forth. Can we explore these methods um, and en enhance our toolkit? Some of the questions that we will be asking in the process are, is this computationally practical given the, uh, the, the resources that we are dealing with or the computational infrastructure we are dealing with? The other thing is, since I'll be talking a lot about statistical models, we will be trying to investigate what the statistical properties of the estimators are. So a natural question that arises is, all right, suppose you have a very fancy optimization method. How much do you gain from a statistical perspective as opposed to using a very simple and popular method? The answer is, it's very nuanced. It depends upon many things. It depends upon the number of samples, the signal to noise ratio, what the underlying truth is, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so to address these issues, this is the lens that we have been uh, looking at. It's basically various boxes. I'm highlighting three, structured learning or statistics. Of course, there are very strong links with convex optimization. And I, uh, I'm highlighting convex optimization because I, I mean, I have worked on, I really like working on uh, algorithms for convex optimization. I'm relatively new to integer programming, but I really would like to scale up integer programming problems for as far as we can stretch them for problems that arise in statistics. And some of the things that I'll be discussing today are how our understanding of convex optimization methods, namely first order methods, can enhance the scalability of integer programming methods. There are other considerations as well, which I was mentioning, uh, but I mean, if I bring this into the picture also, things are going to become very complicated. So I'll keep this as a, as a side actor, okay? So what I'll do is I will uh, spend the se next several minutes on a canonical example. So I'm a statistician, so I really like studying this problem. And I think there are a lot of insights that can be gathered from this. A lot of this is uh, what we are understanding now. And a lot of this is we build on the understanding of the community, not one community, several communities over the last 15 to 20 years. All right, so what is a stylized statistical setup? I'll set it up as a, as a statistical problem because we need a very basic setup. 
to make sense about uh, our estimators and the performance of our estimators. So let's suppose the data is generated from an underlying, underlying truth. Underlying linear model, y equals to x beta naught plus epsilon. Okay, so this is the oracle model. I'm also assuming for the sake of simplicity is beta naught is sparse. So for those of you who are con concerned about the limitations of this model, I mean, true, it seems limited, but there are various natural extensions that you can do to this immediately, which are known as oracle bounds and so on and so forth, where beta naught does not have to be sparse, for example. Beta naught can be approximately sparse, or even the linear model assumption is probably not going to, is not holding. Okay, so, but, I, but to make things simple, I'll assume that this, this, this underlying model holds. I'll also assume that the epsilon errors are normally distributed zero sigma square. And the task is, uh, uh, is, is, pos is positioned as follows. I'm given data, y and x, and I want to estimate this guy, beta naught, by beta hat, okay? I'll use an optimization-based method for this. Suppose I come up with an algorithm, um, and then I spit out a beta hat. What do I care about? I'll maybe caring about these different metrics. This is just a small handful of the different metrics that can be considered, right? One of them is the support of beta hat, is it exactly equal to beta naught? You may also want to relax this by saying is the support of beta hat approximately equals to beta naught or not, all right? But let's say this is one of the questions that I want to understand. Estimation error as well as prediction error. Uh, this may be obvious to some of you, but I would like to point out that in some cases, it may be possible to have a model with, uh, with good uh, prediction accuracy, but very bad estimation pro pro uh, 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 accuracy. And that is because of the presence of X, and intuitively speaking, it can happen if the, if the features are correlated. I mean, these are like information theoretic statements. You just cannot, do not have enough sample to, uh, to estimate these things. In some cases, you're just given a data set, you know probably there is some signal. Underlying model is probably not even sparse. I don't even have a test set. I don't even know what the beta naught is. What do I do then? I may think about, is my model doing well in terms of prediction accuracy, vis-a-vis -vis the number of non-zeros that I have. Okay, so <clears throat> the, the community has been thinking about these problems for a while, and there, there are various canonical estimators. So I know there are people in the audience who have probably worked on various different aspects of this, uh, of these problems. Often I get asked this question, which is the best method? The answer is there is no best method over here, right? So the answer, it depends upon various things. It depends N, P, X, beta naught, epsilon. Okay? So that was a mouthful. But that, that is a fact. There are different regimes where different methods work. It is true that a lot of uh, studies have been done on L1 and LASSO. A lot of studies have been done relatively, relatively less probably from the LASSO, but a lot of work has also been done on stepwise boosting procedures. Uh, people are trying to understand it more in the context of implicit regularization because people are seeing it also in the context of uh, neural networks. But uh, since integer programming is over here, I'll talk about this guy, right? This is a very fundamental estimator, but uh, I, I think, uh, it is only over the past several years, mainly triggered by computational advances, the community, uh, OR and statistics, broadly speaking, has been investigating these problems. All right, so now let's revisit this estimator, right? So minimize least squares subject to the number of non-zeros less than equals to k. So, of course, computation, this can be cast as an integer programming problems. Depending upon how you define small or moderate, this can be solved for whatever problems Gurubi can solve or Mosaic can solve, problem sizes. Under some regimes, there's actually an optimal estimator. You cannot beat this information theoretically. For example, in terms of support recovery. Okay, so a lot of work has been done on this already. However, it can be suboptimal. Suboptimal as in from a statistical viewpoint, it may not be good in some regimes. And why is that? So let's think about prediction accuracy as a metric. If you're thinking about prediction accuracy as a metric, and if I go back, and if I say that the noise variance, epsilon, noise variance is high, that means there is a lot of noise in the system. What happens is this estimator, uh, this estimator does not work well. So for those of you who are familiar with more statistics uh, or ML terminology, basically what happens is the best subset selection has very high variance. You change the data set a little bit, the, the solution uh, variability uh, is pretty high. In these cases, identifying the true beta naught, the, the locations, can be statistically impossible. 
But what do we do in that case? I cannot just say as a statistician that this doesn't work. Uh, let me go on to the next problem. <laughs> because it's an important problem. I, I'm not saying solving this is as such important, but my problem is I'm given a data set Y and X. I want to get a sparse uh, selection of features that works well in terms of out of sample metrics. What do I do? This may not work very well, actually. It may actually give very bad results if the amount of noise in the data is high. <clears throat> so what do we do is, and this is actually something that the community didn't study much, but, but, but uh, once we started having these integer programming solvers, we could explore statistically the performances of this. All right? So then the question is, okay, what should be done? So the proposal that I'll show you is, uh, is, uh, is, a, is an estimator that was proposed in this paper with Peter and Antoine. It is, it's a very minor modification to the best subset selection problem. It basically says, all right, you do selection, least squares, and you add a tiny amount of shrinkage to this. This Q can be an L1 regularizer or an L2 regularizer. So for those of you who are familiar with the Bayesian literature, they just look at this estimator and then say, oh yeah, of course, this is obvious, this is what we do from a Bayesian viewpoint, okay? <clears throat> and what intuitively happens is this guy selects the features, and if you just select the features, you have to shrink, you have to reduce variance, and the reduction of variance comes from this additional shrinkage term. Okay, of course, I'm, I'm giving you intuition, but uh, this can all be proved, and to my knowledge, this is one of the first papers which actually gets into the details of this regularized uh, estimator and proves that the, the, the prediction error bounds and so on and so forth are better than many of the, uh, of the isolated methods. For example, prediction error of this estimator, joint estimator, is actually better than the best subset selection prediction error. Okay? <clears throat> and it has to do with the signal to noise ratio and so on and so forth. Excuse me. Yes. Um, can you relate this to compressed sensing? So mm -hmm. before we, the L0 was relaxed with the L1, and then there was a yeah. tight, um, so we have a convex continuous optimization, and we have a tight bound. Um, yeah, so. right. So the compressed sensing problem is a special case of this, like L1, like regularization. Let's say, let's make this uh, constraint inactive. K is infinite, all right? And then Q is one, is the lasso, right? The lasso is a very fantastic estimator. The equivalence lasso gives you results which are very similar to a best subset. It works under very strong assumptions on X, these, these features. All right, it also, and if you want to get actual support recovery, you need more conditions on Y, X, as well as beta. Okay, so there are regimes where subset selection solution is going to, can be obtained by lasso solutions, but um, there are many instances of X based, uh, when uh, lasso selection results cannot be approximated by lasso. So your framework is more general, actually? Uh, this is, yes, exactly. So this, this estimator is more general, but also is more general, but the catch is lasso is a convex problem. There are many solvers for this. It's not really clear whether there are as efficient solvers for this problem, right? Because many of the properties that I'm discussing over here, they make, they make the assumption that I have a, I have access to the globally optimum solution to this problem. Okay, so that's the place where integer programming is going to come in. Any other questions? All right. <clears throat> so now let's talk about computation. Question. Right Question. Oh yeah, see ya. The, 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 yes. the guarantees are they for um, sufficient amount of training data? Where's the data size? Uh, yes, so the guarantee, so basically, uh, yeah, so it depends upon, I don't have any of the bounds, so it basically depends upon the number of samples, but let's assume your, I mean, all these different methods, say L1 is there, L0 is there, and whatever, estimate A, B, and C are there, all of them have access to the same data. Mm -hmm. In those cases, depending upon the signal to noise ratio, right, uh, if, the amount of, if the amount of noise in the data is high, L1 is very good, or L2 is very good in terms of prediction accuracy. In fact, L2 reach can be better in terms of than L1 in terms of prediction accuracy. What this estimator is saying is, I'll give you a, an estimator with a very similar prediction accuracy, right? Because you see, I'm kind of cheating because I'm, I have access to either L1 or the L2 estimator via, via this. But I will be giving you an estimator which is substantially sparser. And prediction accuracy is out of sample. Yes, that is correct. It's fresh sample, yeah. So the results kick in at some n, but at the same n. 
it's not that this, for example, needs more data. No, so in fact, in, okay, good point. So in fact, you can think of this as the success of this, in order for this to be successful, you can, you can, you, you can be successful with much fewer samples. So if I look at L0 or L1, right, forget about, and think about a high noise regime. Very recently, there have been very strong characterizations uh, where, base, where they say that the number of samples that are needed for L1 to recover the true support are much larger than what is re required for L0 okay. to recover the true support. So if you fix the required prediction required. accuracy, then you, have, you need less. Yes, data. yes. So if you have more computation and there is sufficient signal, mm -hmm. then you can uh, 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 get away with much fewer number of samples. Yeah. So can I ask one more? So, so do you also have a sense of like, uh, if I can only solve this problem approximately, how that uh, might play? Yes, in absolutely. Good so. question. <laughs> You're probably a reviewer. <laughs> so that's a. <laughs> no, I know that. Yeah. So that's a natural. Actually, that's that's. It's an excellent question. So basically, this is just this theory that we do. Uh, you can actually get approximate error bounds, uh, where. Uh, uh, which takes into account, suppose you solve the, your IP to tell 10% optimality guarantee. It is, that 10% is going to appear as of, in the form of a constant over there, yes. And in fact, many of these cases, that's more practical. Exit with a 15% accuracy instead of a 0.1% accuracy. Okay, so let me discuss something on the computational aspects. All right, so I mean, this, this, uh, there has been a lot of interesting work on this by, by various people in, in OR, broadly speaking. So I will get into, the, uh, uh, into our approach, how we do this. And the way in which we do it is we have a two-stage approach for two, not two-stage in the sense of, uh, uh, of oh, oh. there are two types of approaches that we have. One of them are approximate solutions, and the other one are the solutions which give you optimality certificates, okay? So, okay, they serve different purposes, right? Suppose a data scientist wants to get uh, a very good solution to the estimator that I just proposed, that is this estimator. All right, they do not want certificate, certificates of optimality because this is an integer program that can be solved to optimality with integer programming solvers. The question is how far we can stretch the computation of this. Uh, now, suppose a data scientist wants to use this on our data set. All right, and we do not need to care about optimality certificates. What is a method that one should use? Just to explore whether this is a reasonable uh, estimate to invest in or not, or should one be moving over to uh, 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 kernel SVMs and stuff like that. So that's the place where the approximate methods come in. And the other thing is, this is more uh, interesting from a, from a math programming viewpoint, that is, once I have these approximate solutions, can I improve them? towards global optimality, or can I certify that this is the optimum solution, or this is 15% off from the optimum solution? Approximate in the, uh, is there an approximation guarantee or heuristic? No, it's a heuristic. But I guess it doesn't matter so much because if you think about accuracy on validation set, you know that's bounded, for example. Or, you know, you know, you know like typically in optimization, a heuristic approach which doesn't provide guarantees can be problematic because the actual gap could be huge. Uh -huh. But here, I'm thinking more about classification. I don't know if you're doing regression. Here, I guess regression. Regression, but it also works for classification. In classification, yes. we know the max is 100%. So even if there's an optimality gap, in absolute sense, if the accuracy is 93 or 95, you're happy with that. I mean, you already have kind of an optimality gap. because That is correct. Like the Absolutely, yes. Uh, you're talking about that. In the case of accuracy, of course, you have a gap. In the case of regression, also you have, because the uh, Least the loss function is bounded by lower bounded by zero, right? But to add to that, from a more practical viewpoint, I would say that these approximate solutions they actually build on the best heuristics available currently. So in a sense, we it literally scans through the different heuristics. Basically, the approximate solutions what they do is they run very high powered coordinate descent type methods. Why? Because coordinate descent methods are one of the fastest solvers to solve L1 regularized lasso type problems. So it does that. But you can get stuck in a local solution. So what it does is it does local combinatorial search to improve. Okay, and depending upon the size of the neighborhood that you use, you will have guarantees, local optimality certificates. And some of these certificates actually, we got inspired. So I, I, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but we got inspired uh, uh, by this line of work after reading a couple of 
a few papers, a line of work by Amir Beck and, and, and his collaborators. So, uh, so th they were also looking at L0 co cardinality constraint problems and came up with local search and, and how do you think about the characteristics of the solution that you get. I mean, from an optimization viewpoint. <clears throat> and uh, in some cases, actually, depending on the correlation and, and, and other things in the data set, you can actually purely see empirically what is the usefulness of bringing in uh, combinatorial search and what is the uh, and what happens if you do not bring in local search into the problem? <coughs> all right, so now the optimality certificates, this is basically a standalone branch and bound method. All right, so we write it from scratch. Many people told us don't try to do this. Uh, they, they were right because the branch and bound solver that we write from scratch is in Python. It's not nearly as sophisticated as Guru V or Mosaics or someone else's branch and bound solver, but we do a much better job at least we think, in solving the node relaxations. Because that's the place where we use the entire machinery infrastructure methods to solve those problems. Which, to my understanding, Guru B or Mosaic doesn't use. And the other main reason is actually I'm a big fan of infrastructure methods uh, in convex problems. So to give you an, uh, an idea of, uh, of, of how these methods work on real data sets, so this is the typical performance of good heuristics. Okay. So this is an Amazon reviews data set. P is a number of features, 175,000, number of samples to 2,500. So this is Lasso, this is NCV reg, which is a heuristic which exists, and L0 learn, uh, so this L0, L2 combination, L0, L1 combination. So you see in terms of mean square error, uh, these are all kind of comparable. And I would like to point out over here that if you did pure L0 without any shrinkage, the mean square error would have been very bad. Okay, so the shrinkage comes in to, to control the variance. The main difference, I would say, is in the number of non-zeros because uh, GLM net lasso selects a lot of non-zeros with tiny, tiny coefficients, but this one is much more compact. All right, in terms of runtime, if you use heuristics, uh, which is probably more useful from a day-to-day -day usage viewpoint, you are comparable to GLM net. Right? And by the way, this takes a lot of work to do. And uh, uh, so this, this is based on uh, work with uh, with Hussein, and he did a lot of work in the implementation uh, of this. <clears throat> so it's, it's it's and the reason why this is faster is one of the main reasons is because this has fewer non-zeros. So essentially, for these algorithms run active set methods, and that's why they can get uh, uh, solutions in less amount of time compared to L1 type methods. All right, let's talk about optimality certificates. Okay, so uh, this is also open source. Uh, this is uh, a uh, tailored branch and bound uh, method for this. And Hussein and Ali, uh, Ali was a former student, at, 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 uh, a master student at MIT. So uh, they have done a great job in implementing this. We are currently extending this uh, use case to other types of uh, problem classes. Okay, so what is our approach? <clears throat> so this is a problem that we want to solve. L0, we, we consider the Lagrangian version for specific reasons because if you add the Lagrangian version, it become, if you look at the Lagrangian version, it becomes unconstrained and it's more amenable to, first, uh, to, to the algorithms that we use, all right, first order methods. All right, so this is a branch and bound method that is created by our solver. So I think if you zoom in, this is a problem with n equals to 1,000. Yeah, n equals to 1,000, p is actually, the number of features is 100,000. So this actually solves this problem, 100,000 features, and this is the depth, okay? This is actually an easier problem to solve, as you can see from the depth. I'm not claiming all problems are going to lead to shallow trees like this. Some of them can be explored, and some of them can just explode. And after a while, we think that we just reach the place where things become very difficult to compute. Yes. So you're solving this, uh, the Lagrangian. Do you have to... No, yeah, good. Yeah, so I'm thinking that this is a problem that I want to solve. This is the one that has statistical guarantees. Okay, I'll solve this for a sequence of lambda zero and lambda two values. So I'm not thinking of this as giving a dual bound for that cardinality constant problem. So I'm bypassing that issue. All right, so how do we solve this problem? The key driver is, uh, uh, we solve the node relaxations uh, that appear with first order methods. And we, we, our current method can actually solve some cases with p equals to 1 million features. And this is well beyond the capabilities of, of existing solver, commercial solvers that we know. 
Okay, I mean these numbers don't mean much, but I mean, in some cases, it's just Guru or Moses just runs out of memory. You cannot, you cannot just even fill them, write them all. And you get these solutions because you exploit a lot of sparsity in the problem. You do not anticipate uh, many non-zeros. Yeah. All right. So what is a uh, approach? So, uh, so basically, let's think about the uh, the the node relaxation, right? So the node relaxation. So we do binary branching, right? So and the node relaxation turns out to be a second order. Uh, cone program. And for the relaxation problem, we use first order methods. I'll show you how the relaxation problems look like. And this is a key difference with the existing branch and bound methods because they operate using different algorithms, right? Uh, either uh, interior point methods or auto approximation based on LPs. I don't have a methodology uh, or a good idea how to scale auto approximation methods, for example, because they may not be amenable to uh, first order methods. Okay, so it's somehow. The problems that we are dealing with, we can massage them into problems which we know how to solve. All right, so we do approximate strong branching. So uh, this, is, this is a place uh, wh where we actually found out that if you do uh, strong branching, it actually can lead to much tight, uh, shorter trees. Uh, but uh, uh, we, the term approximate is because we do not check all the non-integral uh, um, coefficients, uh, bin non-integral binary variables. Uh, we select a small subset of them, uh, and the updates can be done very rapidly with uh, with first order methods. Okay, but this is a place where the where, where, where we were discussing the ML methods can be potentially uh, uh, can be useful to to improve these these decisions. All right, and this is some kind of a different. This is a difference I would say with existing solvers for, uh, for, for say, for example, the lasso, because if I throw get a solution from GLM net, it doesn't give me a dual bound. Okay. But over here, I need it because I need it for pruning the tree. Okay, so the notion of a dual bound is actually needed. All right, so let's now give you some idea about what is the what is the key thing that I find to be interesting and what is driving these results. All right, so in order to make things simple, let's see what happens to the root node. So the root, so this is the original problem, right? And I'm going step by step. I introduce binary variables and I get a MISOCP, right? Mixed integer second order conic program. And the SOCP constants are over here. I'll use a big M uh, ver version over here. But uh, I mean, you can also do this version where this big M is set to infinity, but you just need uh, then this, this perspective regularization, okay? Our framework can handle this general form uh, where you have M and then uh, the, these SOCP constants. All right, so of course there is a big literature on this. Uh, some of this literature we, we, we learned a lot by looking at the earlier work on this from the IP community. Okay, uh, <clears throat> we were not familiar with all the references, but during the course of the research, we became more familiar with some of this work. So this is a problem that we want to solve, right? Uh, uh, the MI SOCP version, it has variables beta as well as Z. This is the extended formulation. If I look at the relaxation, what I'll do is I'll just relax the zi's to zero and one. Okay. Now, if I just relax the zi's to zero and one, it's, it becomes an SOCP. This SOCP has lots of variables. It has variables beta, s, it has z's, it has lots of variables. That particular form is not amenable to first order methods. So, what we do is we reformulate the problem into this. This is an exact reformulation, by the way. Why do we prefer this? Because if you look at this problem from algorithms that apply for, I mean, first order methods, first order algorithms, this guy is amenable to efficient first order algorithms in convex optimization. But this guy is not so amenable to it. So we need to do the reformulation. And we are lucky because this is an exact reformulation of this problem. Okay? Intuitively, for those of you who like thinking about penalties, this is how the penalty looks like in red. So this is a reverse Huber penalty. So intuitively, this, there, is a, there is a kink over here at zero, which is coming from the L1 guy, uh, the, the relaxation, zi equals to zero and one. This kink is what you also see in the lasso. This is the one that causes sparsity, I mean, during branch and bound. And this one is offering shrinkage. So this is the reach shrinkage. And it appears from the uh, reach regular perspective relaxation that we use.
All right, so now how do I solve it? I do not use proximal gradient methods because proximal gradient methods can be difficult to scale for the, for the speed that we are looking at. We use cyclic coordinate descent with lots of heuristics and some of these heuristics are taken based on the, are, 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 based, uh, are based on the best practices that are used to scale uh, uh, L1 type, type problems. All right, so how does it work? These are all problems where we solve the problems to optimality, okay? So this is synthetic data. This is the size of P, the number of features. 10 to the power 6 is the largest problem that we can solve. L0 B and B is our approach and it can solve this problem up to 3, 4, 6, 8 seconds. In some cases, the number of nodes can be very large. Uh, our paper has the number of nodes. I don't remember them. It can be in some cases hundreds of thousands of nodes. All right. And the dash basically represents that Guru B doesn't terminate or it runs out of memory uh, in a, in a, uh, uh, if you give it a certain timeline. So the cutting plane method, which is listed over here, which also works quite well, uh, but these, all these methods, Guru B, Mosaic, and number 12, all of them interface with uh, commercial solvers. So Mosaic interfaces with Mosaic, Guru B is Guru B, of course, and this usually interfaces with Guru B to solve the MIL outer approximation, okay? But this one is written completely from scratch. So this does not have flexibility, but for this specific class of problems, uh, this actually works uh, relatively well. Okay, and this is a real data set where n is 71 and p is quite large. And if you go on changing the number of non-zeros, uh, this is the runtime. Of course, you see there are two values over here, lambda 2. If the lambda 2 value is very high, the runtime decreases. It may not be very useful from a statistical viewpoint, but that's what it is. I'm, uh, I mean, maybe large values are not that good, or large values may be better from a statistical viewpoint. We don't know. It depends on the data set. We basically vary lambda zero, all right, and that gives me a number of non-zeros, yeah. But this is actually a good point because if you really say, I really want 15 non-zeros and I want a very tight control on that, this approach is not going to give it to you. And then the issue is, if I want to have a branch and bound solver for the Carnegie constant guy, it's more work because of solvers, a coronary descent is not going to apply. All right, so now let's move over to uh, beyond linear parameter models. Okay, so <clears throat> how do I do feature selection? This is more of a modeling issue that I'll discuss and uh, uh, towards interpretable modeling. Uh, so, <clears throat> but the algorithms build on the stuff that I discussed, uh, some of it at least, not all of it, uh, but the focus over here is going to be more on, on, on modeling and how do you think about it from a statistical viewpoint, what models to use. Okay, so uh, this paper is on group variable selection with discrete optimization, it explores both statistical and, uh, and computational uh, aspects. It says it's group variable selection, and then I said I'm discussing uh, feature selection in non-parametric models. The reason is when you have sparsity appearing in groups, it can be used to model nonlinear uh, feature selection, okay? And that's what I'll discuss. All right, so what is the context? Feature selection in nonlinear or non-parametric models all right, so where we are we're going beyond linear models is actually an incredibly important problem, especially nowadays when you have lots of samples, you want to go beyond linearity. But it is arguably much less understood compared to the linear model setting. I mean, it's not really known what is the right way to think about this problem okay, uh, with provable statistical guarantees and probably some understanding of the optimization properties. I'm discussing one method over here, but it doesn't mean that this is the only method, okay? So the method that I'll propose over here uh, is something uh, that uh, for, it does feature selection for a specific family of non-parametric models, which are known as additive models, and it has both statistical as well as computational guarantees. All right, so as a warm up, let's write down the linear and parametric models. These are additive models, and over here in the regression context, we're modeling the conditional expectation function this way. If you want to do feature selection, then an optimization friendly way to think about this is we have a budget on the number of features. All right, so let's think about how textbook statistics generalizes this. They basically say, if I want to do it more non-parametrically, from 1970s this idea came up, or probably even earlier, they say let's do non-parametric. So all that happens is these functions which are linear in every coordinate, xi dot beta, it becomes fi dot xi. If I can be a flexible function. Let's assume if I is smooth, okay? You tell me the, I mean, let, let's say it's piecewise, piecewise 
twice continuously differentiable, or it can be any smooth function. Okay, so this is a smooth family. It doesn't have to be a smooth family. It can be piecewise trees also. And there is actually a very fascinating uh, set of, of, of uh, a, a very nice package on this uh, from, from the Microsoft called EBM, which actually fits models of this one. Okay, not with cardinality constants, by the way. <clears throat> okay, so this is, these are additive models, and this is how I would like to approach uh, the notion of feature selection in, in non-parametric models. All right, so, so these, as I said, have a long history in statistics. This is the set of, uh, this is the problem class that I'm looking at, where each function fi is smooth, belongs to a suitable smoothness class. I'll not get into, the, into, into too much uh, technical details over here, but that's, into, that's the intuition. It belongs, uh, uh, it is sufficiently smooth. And you can tell me what the smoothness, uh, what the smoothness is. And there is a, this ties nicely with the rich literature on non-parametric uh, non uh, smooth estimation. All right, so the estimator is given by this. Um, and this is, as posited, it is an, it is an infinite dimensional problem because I'm optimizing over functions. These are one dimensional functions, smooth functions, and that is it, this is the problem. The issue is this looks like, a, this is actually an infinite dimensional problem, but the good thing is, as you probably have guessed, this problem can be reformulated into a finite dimensional problem, okay? It's something like uh, when you're optimizing over, uh, uh, over smooth functions in one dimension, so it reduces to a spline optimization problem, or if you're using RKHs, uh, 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 optimization, it reduces to a finite dimensional problem. It's kind of a similar idea. All right, and if you start introducing binary variables, this can be written as a very large mixed integer second order conic problem. All right, so uh, this, I'll now quickly go over this. So this basically says that suppose there is an underlying model, y equals to f star plus epsilon. f star has a small subset of guys which are active. And then f hat is an optimum solution to this problem, which is a problem that I showed in the last page. Then this is the error bound that, it, that we have. So the error bound is interesting because it basically says that there is an error that you would do if you were to in, uh, estimate each of the independent individual components. And since over here you're doing a selection, that is going to be multiplied by k star, but there is a price that you pay uh, because of, of variance, and that is the place where this log factor comes in, okay? And okay, I'll just mention certain things. This bound that you get assumes that you get the global solution to this L0 problem. There is a lot of literature on L1-based methods, and over there, you need a lot more assumptions on the problem design to get guarantees like this. Okay, so now let's talk about how I can use, so what, what, what was the motivation application? Uh, so it, this is actually a collaboration that we did with, uh, with, with, with uh, that, that I learned about, a problem that I learned about by our collaborations with the, with the Census Bureau. So what is the context? The context is the following. So if you go to the web, uh, US Census Bureau website, they have something which is known as a Roam application, okay? With that, they can identify people who respond less to surveys. And what they try to do is they try to relate that low response course in surveys to various demographic characteristics. This nice visualization, which is taken literally from the website, is based on a simple linear regression model. No lasso, nothing. At least this is based on, on a paper that, that was written. They had launched a competition in 2012 where they said that come up with a method which improves the prediction accuracy. A group of teams hacked it and they found out a method with very good prediction accuracy. It was based on an ensemble of, of trees. It started using features which were not operationalizable. You could not take those features and do something based on that. So it was not interpretable. It was not that useful. Why is it important to them? Because this is a quote taken from the paper. That is, if you can identify them and by 1% increase in self-response uh, rates, then it amounts to a huge amount of uh, savings in dollars. So that's why they care about this. At least that's what we learned from the paper and from our, our collaboration. So the current method is based on uh, the last method is based on low response uh, score, LRS, which is the output of the linear regression model, okay? So, uh, so the natural question is, can we actually improve the prediction performance of the model? And the way in which we approach the problem is by fitting additive models, okay? And why are, am I saying that these additive models are interpretable? Because if you think about linear regression, why are they interpretable? If you do the Y versus each of the individual plots, each of them are going to be linear lines. This one are also kind of interpretable because you, you can just graph how the conditional functions look like. And I'm not the only person who's saying this, this is interpretable. This is, there is also the, the, uh, the, a group from Microsoft 
based on their papers, they also say that additive models are quite interpretable. And of course, there is this, uh, this, 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 this nice set of results and statistics and models where this is a natural next step, generalization to, to linear models. How am I doing on time? I think I'm borderline. So it's 50 minutes, but uh, like we do have some slack space if you want, maybe two or three more minutes. OK, OK. And then questions, or can I, can I take questions now? Yeah, there's time for questions afterwards. Afterwards, OK, sure. All right, so, <clears throat> so let me uh, uh, go through the remaining part very quickly, some, some of it. So it turns out that if you do just these additive models, there is no interaction effects that are included. So of course, if you want to improve, inter, uh, in the, in get uh, more additive uh, modeling flexibility, you add models with, with, with their pairwise interactions. And then there are these hierarchy constants that we add in, and so on and so forth. All right, so <clears throat> some interesting things. The effect of nonlinearity. Okay, so this is a problem where we trained both a linear model with interactions, with sparsity in them, as well as a nonlinear model with interactions. A black dot over here corresponds to whether that, uh, that, that pairwise uh, feature is active or not. In the case of the linear model, we get a lot more non-zeros. In the case of a nonlinear model, we get a much, much fewer non-zeros. And in terms of prediction accuracy, which I'll show in the next slide, nonlinear models do much better compared to linear models. Okay, so it's actually an interesting thing. There are various aspects to interpretability. People say feature compression is important. Of course it is important, but feature compression for linear models or nonlinear models. This is the feature compression that you get for linear models. This is the feature compression that you get for nonlinear models. You get significantly more feature sparsity compared to this, and this also has more prediction power. Okay. <clears throat> and this is with the same uh, L0 regularization? No, so we, we do that, we tune that. It's a good question. So we tune that, and in fact, uh, here is a list. So basically, they lead to various different types of models with different. So we tune that, and we are not solving an IP because it's too expensive to solve the IP over here. Okay, so I'll I'll basically uh, okay, I'll skip this, and then I'll basically mention a few things about learning trees because this was a topic that was brought up. Learning trees and tree ensembles. This is something that I've been recently working on in the past year or so. I find this fascinating. It's extremely combinatorial objects. There are various ways by which it can be optimized. Okay. You can use discrete optimization if you want to solve it accurately or near accurately, but it also depends upon the infrastructure that you have, how much flexibility you want. For example, there is some of the recent work that we have done on this. So this paper, quant B and B, we look at very shallow trees, depth two or three, and we solve those problems to optimality using our own Taylor branch environment. We call it quant B and B, and it is something that works for continuous features. If you're looking at features with binary covariates, there are actually very good algorithms out there, optimal algorithms, which can do this job for you. None of them touch com uh, 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 math programming solvers, by the way. And some of these problems are like hundreds of thousands of samples. These are incredibly big problems. And what we do is we basic, these are shallow trees, so we do the enumeration very, uh, uh, very effective, uh, I mean, efficiently. <clears throat> this problem, this one, is done with my student Brian Liu. What it says is the following. It says, suppose your data science team has worked on a class of problems for the last year. With lots of parameter tuning, they have built an XGBoost model with 1,500 components. It's very difficult to interpret. Of course, it's going to be difficult to interpret. Uh, if you want to get good prediction models, uh, interpretability is going to be lost because there's lots of decisions. What this does is it tries to take that big ensemble and compresses it to make it more interpretable. And this notion of compression, this is not pure sparsity, by the way. This, is, this controls the depth simultaneously across all the trees. This can be written as a discrete optimization problem. And one thing is about this one, this is a framework which, uh, uh, which, uh, which we use, which, which says, can I train trees in an end-to-end -end fashion using continuous optimization? Why? Because this is going to make it amenable to uh, methods like very flexible loss functions, and if I want to train a tree using GPUs, for example, or SGDs, 
if I, if I can piggyback on TensorFlow or PyTorch, this is a framework which can allow us to do it. And this is going to be much, much harder, actually, if I change the loss function or want to use GPU support for my own solver. It actually needs a lot of engineering. So, so, it, it, so that's, that's what I was getting at when I was saying there are various things to consider. So I hopefully by now I have given you a glimpse of, 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 of the various components of this, uh, of this puzzle. There is statistics over here. There is convex optimization, which is playing a role. There is discrete optimization, which is playing a role. Some of these are very well formalized. Some of these are very, uh, 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 not very well understood. At least a precise picture is not emerging. And especially if you bring in other considerations like computing framework and so on and so forth, things become, let's put it this way, much more interesting. And <clears throat> something interesting to think about. All right, thank you, everyone.